when I was a kid growing up, going to the mall was a big deal. Going to the mall was a big deal. When I was growing up, my brother Ed and I would go to the mall. And when we would go to the mall, we kind of had a, a, almost a ritual or a plan of what we did at the mall. We never spent any money because it was BC before cash, before we had money. But we would go to the mall and like our, our first stop that we would go to was the pet store. Do you remember when malls had pet stores? Do you remember that? Yeah, you go to the mall, you look at the rabbits, and then you look at some new kind of exotic dog that you couldn't afford. Uh, then you'd look at maybe like an iguana. And of course, you save the, the best for last. You would get down there and you would see a boa constrictor. Yeah. Then you'd leave that store and you'd go to the next store. The music store. Do you remember when malls had a music store? They sold grand pianos and organs. Who goes to the mall thinking to themselves, you know what I need? I need a grand piano. I'm going to go down to the mall. I mean, anyway, we go to the music store, and we, you know, look at all the instruments. They will let you play one of the little Kimball organs or something like that or a trumpet. It was a lot of fun. But then we would save the best store for last, right? The coup de grace of the mall back in the day was Spencer Gifts. <laughs> Do I have a witness? Spencer yes, yes. Gifts. Somebody from the 60s who was on LSD somehow got rich. That describes Spencer Gifts. So you're going in there and things are pink and purple and they have all these weird shirts and they have all these toys and gimmicks and games and card tricks and stuff like that. And you're making your way back to the very back part of Spencer Gifts. And the first time this happens to you, it's a, oh, wow, moment. But when you get to the back of Spencer Gifts, you guys know where I'm going. You know what's going to happen, right? Certain parts of you are going to begin to glow. Because young people, they had this technology back in the 70s called a black light. Okay? Yeah, a black light. And when you went back in the black light, you couldn't see it there at Spencer Gifts. All of a sudden, like if you're wearing a light color clothing, your shoelaces, your shirt would start to glow, right? Glow. You didn't know it was there. You didn't know you had the ability to glow, but in that back part of Spencer's, you, you would glow. I thought about that for some reason this week, about how that relates to something else in our life. Something more on an emotional and personal level, not by what we wear. But there are certain things in our life, there are certain maybe songs or a scene in a movie or someone will say something and it's like a black light. It triggers something inside of us and we begin to glow with a sense of shame, shame. Shame is a brutal subterranean emotion that we all deal with, and it gets triggered at different points in our life and in our day. Shame is the OG of negative emotions. Page three in the Bible. <laughs> they disobey God and they realize, oh my goodness, I am naked and I feel a uh, shame. 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 Shame makes you feel less than. Shame makes you feel dirty. Shame makes you feel out of place. Shame makes you feel like an imposter. Shame. Tertullian 
said this. He said that nature soaks every evil with either fear or shame. I was having lunch with a buddy of mine years ago, and he's given me permission to share this story. We're having hamburgers and fries, and I've known this guy for 30 plus years. Really great guy, incredibly optimistic and happy person, successful in his job, his family, very involved in our church. And he said, Ben, I want to tell you something that happened to me about two years ago. I said, go ahead. He goes, well, I, was just, I just finished praying and reading God's word in the morning like I do, and I had this thought kind of bubble up inside of me that said, you know, you're not a failure. You just don't measure up. You're not good enough, and time's running out. He goes, I don't know where that came from. I don't know if that's my own flesh or the devil or what, but that thought keep coming back up. You know what? It's not that you're a failure. You're just not good enough. You don't measure up, and time's running out. And this thought started growing and growing and glowing like shame in his life, and it led my friend into a year battle of depression. Shame can drag us down. And we don't know what to do with that sense of shame. Where do we go with it? What do we do about the glow? I'll tell you what we're going to do, starting today and the following weeks, is that we're going to go to Galatians. We're going to go to Galatians. Galatians is God's microchip of dealing with shame and guilt and a sense of purpose and identity and meaning in life. And today we're going to look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to ask the question and try to answer the question, is it possible to live a shame-free life rather than a shameful life? Is that possible? What does that look like? Look at Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, that means one who is sent out by an authority with an authoritative message, not sent from men or human agency, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, which is um, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. He's writing to a group of churches in a particular region. Grace to you. And peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for our sins, that he might rescue us from the present, e uh, present evil age according to the will of God and from this present evil age, according to the will of God the Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul wrote this book in 49 AD. He wrote it with a purpose to reestablish the authentic message, the authentic gospel. He also wrote it to refute a group of people, some haters and critics that had perverted and twisted and changed this message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of the haters his critics, his enemies have infiltrated these churches in this region and they basically were asking the question, why should you folks listen to him? Why should you listen to him? He's not really a, an apostle, you know. He's not one of the original 12. He never walked and talked and ate with Jesus Christ like they did. He's not from Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, he was a persecutor. He threw Christians in prison. As a matter of fact, he had Christians executed. Now you're going to listen to him and what he has to say. Let me tell you the real gospel and what he left out. And they perverted and twisted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now the Galatians were in bondage 
to guilt and shame. They tried to shame Paul, y'all. They tried to belittle him. They tried to marginalize him. And shame works that way. Shame gets into your system and into my system because of something that you've done or something that's been done to you. Shame gets deep inside of us and we begin to, to glow. We begin to glow. And instinctively, we try to cover up our shame. Like Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves, we do the same thing. So if I'm feeling shame, I'm kind of glowing. It's been triggered in me. I'm gonna put on a cover myself with perfectionism. I'm perfect. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not guilty. I'm not shameful. I'm gonna be a perfect Man, I'm going to be a perfect woman. I'm going to be a perfect mom. I'm going to raise perfect kids. I'm going to have perfect attendance. I'm going to make straight A's. So we try to cover shame with perfectionism. Other people try to cover shame with power. I'm just going to power up. I'm going to deny that I have any shame. I'm just going to deny it. I'm going to push it away. And I'm going to be this powerful man, this powerful woman. That's the way I'm dealing with shame. Others say, forget shame. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to put whatever I want to in my body, whatever chemical. I'm going to put on whatever identity I deem uh, necessary. I feel like expressing at the time. That's the way I'm going to deal with my shame. Shame. We want to cover. Shame says that you are less than. Shame says that you don't have what it takes to face the task at hand. Shame says you do not have what it takes to deal with the moment you're facing in your life. You don't meet a standard of okayness. You compare yourself to others. In comparison, as you know, as someone said, is the thief of joy. When you start comparing your money to someone else's money, when you start comparing your looks to someone else's looks, your body to their body, their success to your success, that creates a sense of shame and envy and jealousy and so many other positive emotions. Social media feeds all that. It just feeds it, feeds it, feeds it, feeds it. Boom. Shame, guilt, contempt, jealousy, envy. Flowing through me 24-7. Scary. Shame takes a voice, a voice of authority in your past and just throws it into your psyche. Puts that voice on repeat. You have been rejected, you'll be rejected. You messed up, you will continue to mess up. Maybe you are a mess up. It's a voice of shame. They were trying to shame Paul. They were trying to say, you're not good enough. You don't have what it takes. You are not the real deal. You are an imposter. You are a poser undermining him, spreading false rumors and things about him, group texting people to do that. But here's the deal. Paul knew something that they didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. Paul knew something that they didn't know. Paul knew the gospel. He didn't just know it in here, though he did, maybe better than anyone who's ever lived. He knew it in here. Paul knew that grace rescues you from guilt and a deep sense of shame. Paul knew 
hey, I am an apostle. I have been sent, not by human agency, not by the original 12, not by somebody else. Christ himself has commissioned me to be an apostle. And I have experienced the grace and the forgiveness and the restoration of God in my life. And I've been living this out, Galatians, for about 15 plus years now. So Paul doesn't mess around. He says, hey, I'm an apostle. I've been sent by Christ himself. He is my authority. And the gospel is grace and peace. The gospel is God's will for you and for me. The gospel is to rescue us from this crazy, evil world we live in. Now, he's not going to zap us out and take us out. We've got to live for him in this evil age, but he's given us a new way to live. Rescue from guilt and a deep sense of shame. When I was in college, uh, a friend of mine was a lifeguard. How many of you, just by case, are lifeguards or you were a lifeguard? Raise your hand if you are. Yeah? You can, don't be, hey, Ronald Reagan was a lifeguard. Maybe that'll help some of you to raise your hands. It's not, nothing be, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Now some more guys raise your hand. All right, Reagan, uh, yeah, okay. He's a lifeguard. So I was not a lifeguard. I love to swim. I love pools. I love the ocean, all that. But my buddy, my, I think it was my junior year, said, hey, Ben, I need your help because I'm training lifeguards and it's their final test. So could you come down and help me at the YMCA and I want you to be, check out this phrase, I want you to be my drowning dummy. Okay? <laughs> Not a dummy drowning. I've been a dummy drowning. It's a whole other sermon. But my drowning dummy. I said, well, okay, well, what do I do? He goes, well, at a certain time in the course, I want you to jump into the deep end of this Olympic pool. And I want you to splash around and go, and act, and go underwater as if you're drowning. They're going to swim out, these lifeguards in training, okay? And they're going to come out and they're going to try to rescue you and bring you to the side of the pool. He goes, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fight them. Fight them, fight them, fight them, fight them, fight them. And then after a while, just quit fighting. And just go limp, surrender, let go. And then they will take you, hopefully, <laughs> and bring you and rescue you and put you on the side of the pool. All those lifeguards know like my friend knows, and many of you know, that when you're going to save someone who's drowning, you've got to be careful. You've got to let them get the fight out until they quit fighting and they finally surrender because if you try to rescue them when they're fighting you, you may drown too. Paul had been rescued by the grace and gospel of Christ. Paul had been fighting and struggling, as the Bible said, kicking against the goads. Finally, God knocks him off the horse, blinds him by the light, reveals to him this amazing, incredible grace that covers our shame, that quells that glow by the grace of Christ. He knew that what he did, what Christ did, is greater than what you did. What Christ did is more powerful than what they did. What Christ did is deeper than what shame did. 
That's the gospel of grace and peace. That's the gospel that rescues us from that deep sense of shame and puts us, yeah, puts us on a new path. Don't let your past define you, but let grace define you. We all have a past. I have a past. You have a past. We've all done stupid, shameful, disobedient things. We have broken God's word. We are guilty. Whether you feel guilty or not, we are guilty. I'm guilty. We all have a sense of shame about us. It's endemic to the human condition. We've inherited a lot of it from our original dysfunctional family, Adam and Eve. And then we've done things, and things have been done to us that create a sense of shame. God loves us so much, he came on the scene in Christ to forgive us, forgive us of our past, and to let grace begin to define you and define me. Paul knew, as many of you know, that grace is able to move you from a place of shame to shalom. Grace and peace I give to you, he says. Grace and shalom. That's the Hebrew word for peace, shalom. That's a fun word to say too. Let's say it. Shalom, shalom. And shalom is more than just peace and absence of conflict. It is the abundance of the life of God. It's a sense of wholeness. It's a sense, young people, of something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. And God makes everything whole and congruent. Shalom is the deep knowledge that because of Christ, my shame has been covered. Because of Christ, he has given me his spirit and I can face what's ever on my plate right now. Shalom means that I'm now a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I am a king's kid. I am equipped. I am empowered. And I can face whatever's on my plate because Christ has taken me from shame to shalom. Right? Yes. <laughs> Paul knew that. Paul knew that. If you had people killed and thrown in prison, do you think you'd have some shame and guilt you may be carrying around with you? We forget that. But he knew that God's power, what Christ did, is greater than what he did. That's what allowed him to be an apostle. That's what sent him out. And that's what was, enabled him to move from that place of shame to Shalom. Shalom. No matter what happens, you're in God's hands. No matter what you face, he has his shalom looking out and over you. And as we continue to dive in to this letter of Galatians. It's my prayer for you. It's my prayer for myself that God is going to continue to reveal to us, right? How we can be people not of shame, but people who live in the shalom of God, and we want to pass that shalom on to others. Let's do that together, right? Let's do that together with the grace of God. And as he said, to him be the glory and praise. All right? Pray with me. 
Would you bow your heads and pray with me for just a few moments as Dakota comes up here to extend our invitation. Father, we thank you so very much for your word. Your word, not my word, your word. God, thank you so very much for your gospel, the gospel of grace and peace and shalom. God, I pray that if someone does not know your shalom today, that they will know that, that they will walk down these aisles and say, I don't understand everything, but I want to be on that path, the path of shalom. Lord, others here are already on that path. They're looking for a church, a place where they can belong and serve, and you're leading them here to second. God, may they stand and come, make their way down front and say, hey, today's the day that we're joining second. Families and students, young professionals, couples, engaged couples, say, hey, we need to be a part of the community. God, may they stand and come down front and be a part of this, your community here today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.